our panel uh, for the next 35, 25 minutes is all about financing a diverse future. And we've heard from a lot of amazing women and underrepresented minority founders and VCs already. We're gonna continue that conversation now. Joining me for the conversation is Lo Tony. Lo is founding managing partner at Plexo Capital. That's a fund backed by Alphabet to invest as a limited partner in seed funds led by underrepresented minorities. Lo will share the landscape of diversity within small and large funds and tell us about the impact that makes on investment. And we have Oksana Malisheva. She is managing partner and CEO of Sputnik ATX, an accelerator based in Austin, Texas. Oksana will share her personal approach to fixing the problem and where companies she's working with are seeing success and some specifically with crowdfunding. So, uh, Lo, I'm gonna just jump in and start with you. Okay. Uh, the numbers are pretty staggering. The stats tell the, tell the story pretty clearly. If we're looking to invest in more diverse companies, where does that change start? Does it start within the funds? And talk to us a little bit about what's happening. I think it does start within the fund because what we've learned is that when you have a diverse group of investors around the table, it's like lo and behold, you end up with a diverse portfolio. Surprise, surprise. And at, I used to be a partner at GV, Google Ventures. One of the things that we did was we invested as a limited partner into seed stage funds led by a woman or a person of color. And the thought was that women and people of color have a non-traditional path to venture and end up with really interesting networks as well as a different lens to evaluate opportunities. And it led to great deal flow for us at Google Ventures. And I decided to scale that up. And just to share some, some data, so Plexo Capital is the firm that I spun out. Our limited partners include Alphabet, the holding company for Google, also Intel, Cisco, and the Royal Bank of Canada. And so what we do is we invest using the same strategy as Google Ventures, seed stage venture funds led by a woman or a person of color. And then we invest directly in the companies that we source from their portfolios. And some of the data that we've seen is that across all of our portfolios of our funds that we've invested into, which include some great funds, uh, including funds here, Female Founders Fund and Workbench, a couple of New York-based funds, what we see is that we about 37% of their portfolios, on average, have a female founder. And when you compare that to the normal U.S. venture fund, I mean, they're only investing in about, you know, call it 10 to 15% of their funds, of their portfolio has a female founder. And then on the minority side, about 47% of our portfolios, of our managers we've invested into, have a minority founder, and that's compared to about 11% to the normal US venture capital fund. So again, going back to my statement, when you have a diverse set of investors around the table, you end up with a more diverse portfolio. And where are we seeing the most diversity within funds? Is that happening at the small funds? Is it happening within the larger funds? I'm glad you asked that question, because you don't see a lot of diversity within the larger venture funds. So that's not where it's happening. The place where you see it most is what we call micro venture funds. And those are funds that are typically sub $100 million funds that are investing smaller checks at the seed stage. That's where you see the most women and people of color who are actually partners. I mean, that's the fastest growing segment for venture. On the larger fund side, what you typically see is that, um, I mean, you know, the partners are usually sub 10% mm -hmm. female or people of color. And most of the diversity in the larger funds happens at the junior level. So the analyst and the principal level, not the people that are making the investment decisions and the people that are bringing home the lion's share of the profits. And we're gonna talk about why that's happening and why we're not seeing those people making those decisions. Um, we're not seeing a lot of diverse representation. Oksana, I'd like to jump to you though. Talk to, us a little bit, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing with your accelerator and especially how you're addressing this problem. Well, with our accelerator, by the virtue of um, me being the lead in our accelerator and my, my partner is Joe, so we have an equally balanced, we have a woman and a man investing. Um, our pipeline is naturally much more diverse because we are mu very much out there in the community soliciting uh, people to apply to our accelerator. And as people see, well, if there is a woman we see, I might get heard. I would venture to say that our pipeline in general is 
much more diverse than the statistics that Lo just mentioned. And of the things that we found, we ended up having um, about 30% of the uh, checks written were to women founders, about also 30% is to uh, the, the companies that have minority founders, sometimes they overlap, and they're great companies. Um, I think the one thing we're trying to convey is that when you come to Sputnik, we're going to evaluate you in the merit of your ideas, and everyone, every single person, no matter how you look, how you speak, uh, where you come from, you're going to get a fair shot. But on the flip side, what I've noticed is, I believe venture capital, to some degree, it's an apprenticeship industry. So for you, it's very much about the pattern recognition. It's very much about having seen that, see what works, how do you really understand and internalize the process. And um, there is a big gap happening because a lot of women analysts and associates are entering the venture firm, but right this second, they're not advancing into the more senior level. And the approach we take at Sputnik is, we're gonna pick a talented woman and without shouting about this much, we're gonna give her a shot. We have two female associates at our firm and they get to see 100% of our investment process. They're hearing 100% of how we go about selecting the companies. We send them into the deep water to try to, in a safe environment, how we monitor it a little bit, but they get to run a um, lead process for the follow-on funding for some of the companies. We oversee that, but they get to try that. And I think, guess what? They do a wonderful, wonderful job. On the flip side of it, when they go out to the community, um, Amanda Eakin, who works for us, she looks like, much more like the entrepreneurial founder that will get to this. She would relate to them much better than I even might because I might be older, you know, there's, you know whatever the reasons are. So as a result, we get really great um, integration with entrepreneurial community, with community of women mm -hmm. founders, with uh, pre-accelerator programs that fund um, minority and women founders, and it, Little by little, it turns to a virtuous, virtuous circle. Yeah, and what strikes me about what you're saying is I, I know that there's lots of women who have a lot of experience in investment and in managing funds, but they don't have necessarily the external relations presence. So what strikes me about what you're saying, Oksana, is there's an intentionality, and I believe you have three female founders. We have three female founders. You know, Sputnik is a fairly young fund, and we have nine companies that we've underwritten, and out of them, three were female founders. Yeah. And I, I wish there would be more, and I think there will be more because we're actively looking for those people to apply to us. Yeah. We're actively coaching them even pre-application to Accelerator. So whether they get a check from us or they get a check from someone else, I think by virtue of the outreach that we are doing, they're much better equipped to handle venture capitalists in the future. Yeah, there's an intentionality that you're speaking about. Um, Lo, talk about a little bit about what's happening within the funds, and I'm going back to what you said about just representation at all levels. Uh, how important is mentorship in solving the problem? I think mentorship is, is very important. A great comment around the venture model being much more of an apprenticeship model than a lot of other industries, and uh, that has pros and cons. I think the con is, you end up with, often, um, a culture that is centered around one prototypical type, uh, you know, the kind of the elite East Coast prep school, um, you know, like an Andover, Harvard, Stanford business mm -hmm. school, and then all of a sudden, everyone kind of ends up looking like that because people have networks that they hire into. And then when you're mentoring, I think naturally we tend to gravitate towards people that remind us of ourselves maybe at an earlier point in our career. And so if you don't have that person that can be your mentor, then that's, that's a problem. Uh, you know, I think that what we need to do, and I think what we're helping solve at, at Plexo Capital, our little piece of the puzzle, is to you know, kind of kickstart this flywheel of getting more people involved in technology. I think we have a future pipeline of VCs uh, if you believe that a lot of you know entrepreneurs and, and former product managers make really good VCs, then we have this whole community now of people that have the skill set, that have been there, done that because they're entrepreneurs, and maybe down the road, they will be able to to become a VC or you know joining a fund or starting their own fund. Is there a feeling in the industry that um, you aren't rich enough? to be a fund manager? I mean, is that something that you yeah, still I, hear? So I, I, I shared a great anecdote that I heard from a, a female 
um, who was raising her own venture fund. And, you know, some, some more data. You know, typically it takes between 18 to 24 months to raise a venture fund. And you should kind of give yourself that cushion to go out financially to be able to, to achieve success in raising your target fund. I had a female GP who's looking to raise, general partner, who's looking to raise her own venture fund, and she told me an interesting story, is, which was she was pitching a prospective limited partner, so a prospective investor, to her fund, and that person was a retired VC. And he told her, he said, hey, you know, you need to be prepared to go a couple of years without a, you know, without a salary or minimal salary in order to raise your fund. And she said, well, you know, I haven't really gotten to that place in my career where I can do that. And then he just very frankly told her, well, then you're not rich enough to be a VC. And, you know, I just think that that mindset exists. It's out there. It's something that I think is limiting. Um, you know, I don't think that wealth equates to understanding which companies are going to be the companies that are going to create multi-billion dollar opportunities. Um, but I think that mindset really just kind of speaks to things that need to be changed within our industry. Yeah. Oksana, what do you yeah. say about that? Well, to me, that's a, that's, that's a point very well made. Um, when I look at the female VC raising the fund, this is not that much different from a female founder launching her own startup. And there are certain things you're going to have to sacrifice in order to become successful. Early on in the startup life, it's a ramen noodle regime. I'm sorry, there is no other way around it. Um, and unless you have a trust fund, you have a choice to make. And you're not going to go starving, but you're also not going to be jet setting. And if this mission, if your company or this fund is so very important to you, then you'll find a way. So to me, I don't disagree with that retired VC. And I think not rich enough is the wrong word to use. I would use not committed enough. Because there is a way to save. You hear countless stories of the founders that had professional jobs that saved money because they were committed to making a path. And every company that I see that, you know, and that to me is one of the aspects that will signify grit. And grit, my perspective, is the number one criteria that will either make or break entrepreneur. And it's also the number one criteria that either make or break a female we see. So, yeah, so we've talked a little bit. We started with the funds, uh, the fund managers, and moved over now into actual startups. Talk to us a little bit, Oksana, about some of the success stories you've seen, specifically with crowdfunding. Well, with crowdfunding, what we've seen, we've funded one company that is a crowdfunding. They are aggregated. If you think about the kayak of crowdfunding, New Chip is one of the companies that we funded is that. And they're growing very, very rapidly. They have a really great way to interact with entrepreneurs. And what we are seeing is the statistics that is flowing through their fund is quite dramatically different than the statistics that have been just quoted by Law, which is at the very high end. Because, and we thought, why is that? Our current hypothesis is that as a society, we are much more open to minority founders and women founders having a great idea. And you're pitching it to people like you on the merits of the idea. And there are no preconceived notion, and people who are picking you, their composition will be much more similar to how the entrepreneurs would look like. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, he gave me um, quotes that are just about 13 times as likely the woman will get funded on that platform then uh, overall. We'll see how that will hold. You know, they have to, the deal, those deals have to mature and go through the pipeline. But empirically, we are definitely seeing this. And for women founders, if you're an entrepreneur who is committed to your mission, you will find a way to finance your company in any which way possible. So I'm seeing women founders financing their companies through customers much more. If someone, people don't give you funding, you see, okay, let's get customers to prepay. Um, let's make a very, very passionate um, inroad in the crowdfunding because you get to put yourself much more out there. And if your story is convincing, you might get a fun funding through that channel. Yeah, I love what you said because it's this attitude. It's not venture or bust, it yeah. sounds like. Lo, what are your comments? No, I 100% agree. And I think the new opportunities for people, for entrepreneurs to raise money is what will also help to drive change in our industry. I think that when we have more success stories for women and people of color who now have alternative paths to be able to raise funding, um, that wakes people up. You know, if you, if you reverse 20 years ago, where the ability for an entrepreneur to get funding was 
by having one degree of removal from this small network of people, we didn't have the other options to get funding. So as a VC, if I missed an opportunity because that person was two degrees away, I didn't really care because that wasn't going to come back to haunt me, right? Mm -hmm. But now those things can come back to haunt you because, you know, you could pass on a company or not have the ability to find that company at an early enough stage to get a large enough percentage to drive the return you need. And so now I believe that because of alternative platforms like crowdfunding, the rise of angels, platforms like AngelList, you have much more visibility into other paths of funding. So as a venture capitalist, you want to have a network that's as broad as possible so that when you cast your net, you're going to actually capture those folks. And I think that's going to be, I mean, you know, VCs, we're a greedy bunch. And so when we <laughs> see that we're missing out on making yeah. money from women and people of color, that will 100% change our behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, did you have a comment? I, I'm thinking yeah, of your I ramen noodle to add, regime. Because I love this is we are a greedy bunch. And our fiduciary is to deliver the best returns to our limited partners within the scope of what we've committed to do. Um, so I, would encu I often encourage and mentor women entrepreneurs and minority entrepreneurs, do not give up on VCs. Very few of us wake up being jerks and we come to work with the only mission, let us not fund uh, women, let us not find minorities. And that's not how we, how we come to work. But if your product is different, so I give example, Kim Roxy, she is just this dynamo entrepreneur just graduated. Her company, Lamique Beauty, makes vegan organic cosmetics for multicultural women, for women of color. So more likely than not, she will be pitching that idea to a group of white men. They have no clue. They've never bought cosmetics ever in their life. And they have certainly never shopped for cosmetics as a black woman. So how would they understand what is, what is the black professional woman going through unless Kim takes time to really articulate that? And she does such a beautiful job of explaining that. And on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, she reminds them of numbers because VCs are a greedy bunch. So if 53% of emerging US population are women of color. And if you go to any store, I challenge you to go to any store from Newman Marcus to CVS and take a look at the cosmetics that is made for women who do not look like me, you would be astounded. And if you gild the lily and you realize that black women actually spend by different uh, accounts at least twice as much, sometimes I've seen quotes nine times as much, that's kind of hard to believe. So like put it like at four times as much as white women on cosmetics and grooming, wow, that's a good business that no one is addressing. Why would you not fund that? And then you add a dynamic entrepreneur who is charismatic, gritty, and already had a great product market fit, that is a no-brainer. But it takes for her, she cannot come in and say they should understand me. She actually takes a very deliberate effort to understand, to, to, to make people understand mm. without making them feel excluded. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm sitting with two ostensibly very diverse uh, uh, folks in VC, and you also run a fund as well, Oksana. Yeah. Um, Lo, tell us about how did you, tell us your story. You incubated Plexo Capital out of Google Ventures. Was that a challenge for you? It was actually, it was a great opportunity because it gave me the platform to be able to take a strategy that had been tested at Google Ventures and proven out and then the ability to be able to you know, have the support. Obviously, the backing of Alphabet helps a lot. Um, and I think that you know, kind of going back to that comment about not being rich enough, you know, I was very blessed to be able to have that platform. I think there's a lot of phenomenal investors out there who even by using grit um, still might not necessarily have the economic ability to be able to, to start their own fund. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard to get a seat at the table <clears throat> at an existing fund. So, you know, I, I believe that there are some new models um, that are out there that I think will be able to provide support for people that want to start a fund uh, and maybe need a little bit more flexibility on the economics. Uh, what are you know, some of those models? I think there's, um, so I've been talking to, to some other folks that are LPs, that are limited partners. We are the people that invest into venture funds. And we've been looking to start programs that's almost like, you know, kind of like a formal incubation model where someone can actually have a platform to operate off of, have some shared services, 
There's no reason That's for easy. someone to go and pay for the same documents to be able to raise a fund from a lawyer and just pay and pay and pay, right? It's like if you have five people, they shouldn't all pay the same price. You can share some of those services. You can share some of the back office services. Mm be able to provide a little bit of a stipend so that they can have. So in, in, in the world of venture capital, there's something called an entrepreneur in residence. So an entrepreneur in residence is typically someone that a venture fund has worked with in the past. They come and they have a place to have an office um, that they can come to every day. They can bounce ideas off of the partners and they actually get paid for it. So you actually, VCs, we pay entrepreneurs to hang out and just kind of think of a company they want to start or Maybe they want to be a VC and they want to try that out. And I think that we could do a similar model for people that want to start venture funds. I mean, in essence, that was the opportunity that I had at, at GV. Great. Talk to us about your experience, Oksana. Well, my path to investing in venture, probably one of the most improbable ever because I was born in Kiev, Ukraine. When I was graduating, going to high school, I think the Soviet Union was just about to break out. So just to imagine me sitting here on the Bloomberg stage talking about my path and becoming a venture capitalist is almost an improbable story. I would have not dreamt it. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, but... Um, my story looking back is a story of professional ADD because I came to this country as a PhD physicist and I got my PhD at UPenn and that's where I first got exposed to, wow, all these different varieties and my first path into entrepreneurship was through trying to figure out how to capitalize on my physics degree. And then multiple steps because I worked at McKinsey here in New York, I used to run marketing strategy at Motorola and was part of a phenomenal team at the time of Razor and only after that I went into investing. And so to me, the combination of these experiences, the business, uh, PhD in physics, I was always one of the very few women at the table. So it never fazed me. And frankly, people have been super nice to me. Um, in this um, world of the Me Too movement, I'm maybe one of the few women that I look back and I was incredibly blessed because I always had at every stage of my career a phenomenal male mentor that elevated me. And so those people exist and we do not shine nearly as much light on, on those people as we do on the jerks that do the opposite. And um, they need to get the credit. And then McKinsey is just phenomenal schooling in business and you get to sit in the same room as the best CEOs in America. If you're observant, you got to learn a few things. And then Motorola at the yeah. time of Razor was just such a great school in marketing. Well, I, so I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have to comment that I, you're singing to something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is the important role that men can play in solving the problem. And there's money on the table. There's money being left on the table every day, every second, if we don't look at the problem. We have just a few more minutes left. What is um, one parting word that you would give to our audience, whether it's around crowdfunding or also looking at the future of... Uh, diversity in VC, and I also would love to say that, Oksana, you made an intentional decision to set up shop in Austin. So this diversity is changing and the landscape is changing every day. Uh, what does the future look like? Well, I'm going to start. The future is changing. The future looks different. And um, my mentor, Jeffrey Forrest, said, would like to quote, future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So for those of us in this room and those of us listening, you could choose to manifest that future, either by mentoring a woman, a mentoring a talented minority, or by becoming that, because if you're a woman founder, you may not have been born to carry the flag of being the best woman entrepreneur, but that might be the choice that the world is presenting to you so that others behind you could have... Um, a much better path and so that you could prove to everyone that investing in women, investing in minorities is plain good business. So my parting words is pressure is a privilege. So for those who are in the position to make that change, embrace it and lead it and help at least one talented person to pave the way for the future. The future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. distributed. Low? I would say the the face of entrepreneurship is changing, both in terms of gender, um, ethnicity, and even location. I agree the, you know, San Francisco does not have a monopoly on all the good ideas. I actually think that there's benefit to going outside of the San Francisco Bay Area and into some of the other tech ecosystems. 
And diversity is, is just good business. You know, there's enough data now that is shown at all levels, whether it be from the boards of the Fortune 500s down to the, the rank and file of startups, that when you have a diverse team, those companies perform better.